Combat is not an element that's present in every single game on the market, but it's undeniably a large part of video games as we know them. From punching and kicking, to slashing, to shooting, to blowing up things with nuclear arms, hundreds of games give us the chance to duke it out with various enemies and feel the raw power of violent conflict. And while much of this violence rewards us with points for our score, health or ammunition drops, or most notably progression through a campaign or storyline, something that's often overlooked is how combat is a rewarding experience in and of itself, or rather, how it's fun. Today we're going to take a look at the ways that games make combat feel good, feel bad, and in general how to tailor destroying the bad guys in your game to make players enjoy the battle. My name is Sunder, and you're watching Levelhead, a series about video game design. As said before, combat can take various forms. Whether it be stomping on the heads of walking mushrooms or crocodiles, doing battle in a fighting ring meant for two combatants to have a fair match of physical combat, delving into a dungeon and hacking and slashing against subterranean monsters, or gunning against a warring civilization in a struggle that spans the galaxy, combat in video games plays a large role in gameplay that can't be understated. Storyline, character progression, and other factors can be the inherent rewards of finishing a battle. But the meat and potatoes of good combat lies in what most people would refer to as game feel. It's an ambiguous title for the feedback given to the player while playing the game, and often referred to when talking about games that have above and beyond polish, atmosphere, and visceral feeling when playing them. It can make mediocre games give the impression of being more fun than they actually are, which is a sneaky tactic that has led some of the highest selling and highest player based games out there to lead the market, even if they aren't the most balanced, most polished, or indeed the most original. Diablo 3 comes to mind in this sense, where the gameplay itself when examined under a microscope isn't incredibly deep or super engaging. Much of the fun comes from combining a few moves together and maybe a few legendary items to augment those moves into a set of attacks that makes this happen. Now what was shown wasn't necessarily a difficult task, but damn it felt good. Clustering dozens of enemies together and watching them ragdoll across the screen from my ability, that feels powerful. That's me, kicking ass and taking names, corralling a bunch of demons into one spot and obliterating them into a rain of corpses that litter the air around me until I dash onto the next group to redo the whole process. I actually love Diablo 3, I think it's a lot of fun, but I don't think it's a really interesting game, I just think it has some great feedback when I'm fighting enemies. And that's not an attribute of the game that's a secret, it's something obtainable by many games. What Diablo 3 does is give the player a satisfying response to planning their build and performing their skills in the proper manner. I would say that most games with combat in them can do this. They can make players feel good just from swinging the sword and not only from picking up the loot from the body afterwards. So what is the anatomy of satisfying combat? Let's run it through step by step in five parts. First things first, the player needs to know the parameters of their attack. This means that when they punch, slash, or shoot, they get the proper audio and visuals that clue them into exactly how that move works. In order to draw out the most satisfying response, it's important for players to feel like they understand their abilities, so that when they make an attempt to execute those abilities, the outcome is something that they had planned for, expected, and will be pleased with. There are exemptions to this. Of course, it's always fun to subvert player expectation and give them wild things to deal with on the fly, but for core combat, for the main gameplay loop, the player should be able to quickly discern which of their options is the quickest, which is the highest raw damage, which is situationally useful, which is helpful from a distance, etc. So plan animations and hit effects and sound effects accordingly. When a move deals massive damage, heavy bassy sound effects and flashy visuals can convey this very easily. Think about the rocket launcher from the Halo series. The weapon itself takes up a massive portion of the screen, it's huge and boxy with oversized barrels on the front, it has a tiny pool of ammo, it appears rarely, and when you shoot it, it does this. Listen to that bassy launch and that explosion. Watch how the travel time of the rocket is fairly slow and deliberate. Without even having an enemy to test this on, it's fairly clear that this is a high damage weapon and a force to be reckoned with. Put it next to an assault rifle, a pistol, and a plasma rifle, and this is clearly a weapon that feels like it has weight to it. This is a great example of giving the player knowledge of what to expect from their actions taken from this, and it delivers on those expectations, sending enemies reeling and vehicles flying through the air. While the idea of this may seem minor, I'll be talking about it a lot, so allow me to refer to a talk from the Amsterdam Control Conference in 2013 that you may be familiar with on this subject. It's by Jan Willem Neyman, one half of Dutch independent game studio of Lambeer, creators of Ridiculous Fishing, Nuclear Throne, Luftrausers, etc. At one point in the talk, he recalls speaking with a developer from Bioware who was in a meeting with investors for the game that they were working on. To paraphrase the situation, essentially the investors told them to fix a certain gun in the game being worked on, saying it wasn't balanced and it was a bad weapon. Said developer had an idea, and instead of fixing numbers or how the weapon worked, all they did was open up the sound files for the gun and apply some liberal bass boosting to make it sound more powerful. The next time he showed the build to the same people that had said it was a bad weapon, they reported back saying it was fixed and it felt great. Good for thought to say the least, but let's move on. 
Next up, if you want your players to enjoy hitting things and shooting things, let them know that hitting and shooting things is effective. The easiest example of this comes from back in the low-res era of gaming where enemies would flash white or red or yellow when taking a hit. This is positive feedback. It conveys that the player's actions are dealing damage and ultimately moving them towards their goal. But let's take it a step further. It doesn't have to be a flash of light that shows damage, even though that's an effective solution. Enemies can be knocked back or staggered by a heavy hit. Sound clips can be used to show they're feeling the pain of the player's weapon or that their armor isn't holding up well to being assaulted. A great example of this done poorly is in The Elder Scrolls Oblivion. While the sound effects are good enough for the most part, they're basically the only indication of a connecting attack with an enemy aside from directly watching their health bar lower, which in my opinion is not a good way to handle it. The weapons feel like they have weight on the input side, but the output shows no physical effects on the enemies. It's incredibly common to watch a bandit shift from looking in near perfect health to being dead in the span of a single attack. They don't react to the player's input in battle, and for a lack of a better way to say it, that just feels bad. Which is a good launching point into the next Next one, past the point of displaying clearly that the player is using their abilities to damage enemies, it's important to tailor all the details to show the player exactly how effective those abilities are. From a baseline standpoint, let's just say you have a first person shooter with two different starting weapons, an automatic rifle and a shotgun. Firstly, these guns should not have the same firing and hit sound effects, and not even from a standpoint of making them realistic or anything. They should sound distinctly different when used to imply strengths. When unloading the rifle into a shambling zombie, it can maybe slightly slow the zombie down and have sound effects mainly in the mid-range of the spectrum. Small hit particles can show it's doing moderate damage, and then plainly visible from the zombie continuing to move forward and attack, the player would be able to see that this weapon will deliver a kill after a short time. All of it tells the player that the rifle is useful, but not incredibly powerful. Then when they swap to the shotgun, crank things up. Again, heavy, bassy sound when the bullet spread impacts. Much larger splatter and flash particles to designate heavy damage. Instead of a slowdown on the zombie's walk, it can straight up knock them back, stagger them, or hey, if it's a point blank shot, just downright deal the killing blow. Just by letting the player use these two weapons firsthand, it's clear which does what. It's apparent from the moment the bullet connects that not only is damage being dealt, like in the last step we talked about, but also how much damage. The player doesn't have to feel all powerful for the weapons to feel good. They just need to feel like what they're seeing and hearing and experiencing matches what's actually being done by their attacks. Which I guess is a nice segue into the next bit. We're almost through this, I promise. Only one more after this. Give your enemies an appropriate amount of health and damage. You often hear the term bullet sponge thrown around when talking about games with enemies that aren't particularly difficult, but require altogether too many hits to take down, thus slowing the pace down and ruining the flow of combat. You can see this misstep being taken with a lot of bosses, where the actual battle becomes a situation of avoiding the same attacks over and over again, hearing the same voice clips, and chipping away at their colossal health bar for 15 minutes to beat them. This is not to say that every enemy should die relatively quickly, nor is it to say that a huge health bar is inherently a bad design choice. Just that the actual battle surrounding an enemy with a lot of health needs elements of design to complement that choice. But I will say there are many more creative ways to deal with chunky enemies. Take the darkness from Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. They're dangerous with large swords that deal high damage, and they're armored from head to toe. They take a few more hits than other enemies, but by utilizing some of the tools in Link's disposal, they can be stripped of their weapons and armor. This makes them vulnerable, but also more agile. They can use fast hand-to-hand -hand attacks and move more quickly. Instead of just being a large knight that takes 20 hits to kill, there are puzzle elements baked into the fight that provides an ebb and flow, and ultimately makes them more threatening, more imposing, and more interesting. Interesting enemies are fun to fight because instead of smashing the attack button dozens of times, there's thinking and reaction involved. I mean, that's basically what makes up the majority of Dark Souls, isn't it? A lot of enemies in the Souls series go down in a handful of attacks, but the player character does as well. This makes combat incendiary. A single misstep can blow up in the player's face, but that doesn't necessarily mean they need to take it slow. That last one was a little more esoteric than the other points, but I feel it's still relevant to the conversation at hand. So lastly, let's cool down with a simple one. When enemies eventually go down, make sure the player knows it. Explosions, blood splatters, pixely bursts of color, corpses that ragdoll to the floor from the momentum of the attack. Give your players a little show to indicate their victory. I've said it throughout every other point, but conveying information clearly is so integral to this entire process. So that when the final blow is dealt, there can be a resting period, a moment for celebration and to let the player have that sigh of relief that they worked for. Take the Lynels from Breath of the Wild. These guys can be really tough to fight, and they're one of my favorite enemies in the game. Once you deal the final hit, they let out a somber roar of defeat and drop to their knees. Where other enemies just burst into purple smoke immediately, the Lionel blackens and burns away, kneeling before the opponent that bested it in a duel. It's theatrics like that that adds so much to bringing it down. It's almost like a recap indicating to the player that they've just taken down a powerful force, not just another run-of-the-mill grunt. But even for run-of-the-mill grunts, there's still room for this. 
Let's jump way back to Diablo 3. Watching 40 or so scarabs in Adria's lair cluster up together only to be flung wildly in all directions from an explosive ability is satisfying. It's the cherry on top of every encounter. Hopefully this list of things to help your combat feel better has been helpful. I could bring up dozens of examples of games that employ a lot of what I was talking about, so I'm sorry if I didn't mention your favorite one here, but I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Granted, a lot of what I talked about applies mainly to action games, but elements of it exist throughout gaming in smaller forms. This episode of Levelhead is sponsored by Dollar Shave Club, and you can go to dollarshaveclub.com sunder and get a one month membership of any razor for one dollar. Free shipping, no commitments, cancel anytime. Dollar Shave Club is a subscription service that allows you to avoid the aisle full of Transformers concept art razors and instead get quality blades shipped right to your door. Are you maybe like me and don't need a clip of razors every single month? Not a problem, because you can tailor the frequency of boxes based on your needs. If you head to dollarshaveclub.com slash sunder and sign up, it helps directly support this channel and you get a nice box of shaving supplies for literally a single dollar with free shipping and no long-term contracts locking you down. Thanks as always for watching and a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters that keep the show running. You can see their names on screen right now and if you want to help support the show you can click the link to head to patreon.com slash sunder to join them. You can get your name in the credits, read my patron only blog posts, and more. As always, my name has been Sunder and I'll catch you guys next time. Peace!